Kevin, hi. Hi. <laughs> Uh, you're a professional in military, Saber. I mean, you came here as a very classical military who are ready to help us, Ukrainians, just directly from the battlefield. Yeah, but I came here six years ago. And from the beginning, I worked with OBSJ. Aha, ти в українську вже вчив. Так, так. Коли я приїхав, я не знав, я без коріння, я не знав нічого про Україну, про українську історію, але я читав, читав про ці речі і був дуже, я можу сказати, був дуже ясний моральний вибір для мене знати українську мову. Дякую тобі за це. We will make, we will record our interview in English, but next time we will do it in Ukrainian language. Perfect, yeah. perfect. <laughs> so, my first question, it's my tradition about geopolitical situation. Mm -hmm. My personal estimate that a lot of people now looking, trying to understand what will be the result of meeting Trump uh, with uh, Zelensky, Biden with mm -hmm. Zelensky, all this shuttle diplomacy. Two weeks ago, we had here in Kyiv shuttle diplomacy from Anthony Blinken, from Boris Johnson. I met Boris Johnson. Yeah, I have a photo with him. I mean, there's so many diplomatic activity all over the world, and even in global south from China. Mm -hmm. And I think our part of even our allies in, in the Ukrainian side, they think that war will stop soon. I don't believe. I think we should be ready for long-term marathon distance with some kind of, I don't know, any kind of possibilities, ex expansion of the war outside yeah. Ukraine, or focused in Ukraine, where Russia tried to uh, destroy the country. Intensify so their attacks. How, yeah, yeah. How, how you see this tendency? I, uh, I, don't, I won't comment on, on expansion, or, or, uh, yeah, yeah. because I really I don't know much about that. Yeah, yeah. But from, really from the second year, I have been thinking that this, is, this war has at least six years in it, at least. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people become very demoralized when they hear that, but it's just, it's sort of, these are historical forces. You look at, at similar wars and you're, you're looking at four to 10 years mm -hmm. with how they go. And so mm -hmm. I, I do believe that we have to settle in, like you said, for a marathon. The time for a sprint is over. Now we need to start very carefully uh, apportioning our resources and preparing for that long distance. Uh, you said countries similar to this conflict. What kind of conflicts you, th you, 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 you think, what kind of conflicts we may use to compare, I mean, uh, with, I mean, it's complicated. However, uh, I know that you are a military, a professional military, you served in different countries. I think it's complicated to find a, red, a, 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 a real example, even yeah. con con concerning the technological. Yeah. Some say that it's first technological war. I mean, what, what is the biggest difference between the previous wars? So, to, to start with, I think the, the most, the, the war that I compare it to most closely uh, is the Spanish Civil War. Uh -huh. uh, not, not for any kind of particular uh, political mm -hmm. reasons, uh, but because the, the Spanish Civil War was um, smaller scale, mm -hmm. regional. It, mm -hmm. wasn't, uh, it, was, it was the precursor to, obviously, a world war. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was one where uh, you had two very clear sides. Mm -hmm. You had those sides both uh, receiving aid from uh, external parties, mm -hmm. so either either the allies supporting the um, the non-nationalist side and mm -hmm. the uh, Germans supporting the nationalist side, um, and they were using each of them were kind of using the that war as a test bed for new uh, military technologies, and I think we're seeing something similar here, um, but I also that's ties into the technological aspect. Uh, I think there's much more, many more similarities, but bringing it back to technology, this is um, one of the big things that a lot of people have been talking about in military circles is the transparent battlefield. Mm -hmm. And the question has been, how is, how is real time, uh, even visual scanning of the battlefield uh, going to affect uh, the way that we fight? Um, that's probably the biggest one because you now have uh, well, now a squad of soldiers, we'll say 10, 10 soldiers, they can have high quality aerial imaging straight available to mm -hmm. them via a commercial drone. That, that, makes much, that makes a massive difference, totally disruptive difference, I would say, 
in in uh, battlefield tactics, and we're actually re we're still adjusting to it. Um, many of the principles, the fundamental principles, remain the same. You still want to surprise your enemy, um, but how you go about doing that is is uh, very different now because you have to think down on this very small scale about suppressing the enemy's ability to to view you, um, and that's very new because it, drones themselves are not so new they're they're a rapidly maturing technology mm -hmm. but once upon a time i would say well certainly 20 years ago a drone would be a big multi-million dollar asset that was controlled maybe at the brigade level we'll say we will we'll go to, to, to this yeah. question but finishing the first part of our of question uh, i like your comparison with uh, spain because geopolitically historically we in the same period, on the eve <laughs> of the possible more or bigger war. Yeah. Actually, this guy, uh, Stepan Mandera, he was active and started his activity in the 30s when he was get trained and then trained and his competitors trained the others. So they were preparing, they were understanding, they were, they, they, they were understanding the situation in the 30s and they were yes. prepared themselves for political, military activity. So you think that we historically in the same age of the geopolitical shift, I would say. Oh, 100%, 100%, yeah. because we're seeing, we, we're kind of waking up from the, the peaceful little ignorant sleep of the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, I understand 90s were very different here mm -hmm. in Ukraine mm -hmm. than they were in Canada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, that was when I, that was my childhood. And, and it was a very innocent time. I didn't know what the word terrorist meant, for example, until 2001. Mm -hmm. um, we in the West developed this idea that history had ended and that the, the, the historical forces were now over, there, uh, there was no longer going to be large-scale wars. And, and, and this belief, this, that particular belief, held into, well into the 20-teens. Um, in fact, I would, I would say that it wasn't until 2014 that we even started to, like, began to wake up out of that, that innocence of the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, I, when I was a young soldier, I joined the Canadian Army in 2008. When I was a young soldier, I, w I looked at the world. I looked at our activities in Afghanistan, our allies' activities in, 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 in Afghanistan, South Iraq. Yeah, to, 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 to South Asia, to South Asia, Georgia, you saw these we, events. We, we saw yeah. it, we saw it, but it, in, in the West, like, the, you, don't know, you don't know very many Georgian people. In, in mm -hmm. Canada, there isn't, you know, there's not the same kind of uh, diaspora, diaspora in Canada. Like Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. So, so we saw these things, but it was, it was kind of vague awareness. Um, what, what really woke it up was the beginning of the war here and, and Russia's uh, mm -hmm. first invasion in 2014, where we're seeing one of, the, one of the world powers, which we thought would only be involved in asymmetric wars, we're seeing them go... Uh, invade a neighbor and begin what we call a, a near peer conflict, and and it was and that was kind of uh, that was a I remember watching the news. I was uh, I guess I was a young corporal, and uh, I'm watching the news at night. It was it was a, I'd come home after doing some army stuff, um, and I'm watching the news and we're seeing this invasion unfold, mm -hmm. and I and I kind of asked aloud rhetorically, are we going to do anything about this? You know I, I'm a, I'm a this is a trained soldier. I, I'm, I'm geared towards aggression, and I'm watching one country unjustly aggress against another, and, and then listening to the values that I'm told every day, and I'm saying, like, what's going on, guys? Aren't we, shouldn't we Very, say very, very um, insightful, I would say, and uh, interesting um, insight in, mm -hmm. the, in your motivation. Yeah. So you were active in training. My second question yes. in, in training, and you witnessed some events before full, full scale invasion. And you, with your, together with your team, with advisory operating training group, I would say, mm -hmm. uh, you work with a lot of uh, Ukrainians, Ukrainian citizens who serve in the army in different divisions. What is your main, what is your philosophy and main idea to contribute? To, to, to give the skills, to share the skills, because, um, I mean, some Ukrainians think that they, they already experienced, and they can say, okay, man, okay thank you very much, but <laughs> give just yeah, weapon, we, money, and we can do Yeah, we know how to do this. Yeah, but on the other hand, I mean, Ukrainian experience is already wildly known. 
Okay. But the method methodology methodology on the methods, the tools which used by Ukrainians, not always modern. I mean, they some to some extent some some are Soviet or they, handmade. I would say. Yeah, they could they could use optimization. Yeah, how and we can uh, ally or or, or, or Mary, unite unite marry yes. Western methodology and Ukrainian experience. And, but this is so. This is exactly what we are here to do. Mm -hmm. um, we have in in sort of the NATO format militaries, we have very strong uh, training methodology. It's, it's systematic. Uh, we, we look at training as a system of, uh, of different things. So you're combining uh, physical training, you're combining theoretical training, uh, skills as separate from both of those things, like skills training. But then you're also constantly reviewing how, how does this training work? How does this training impact outcomes on the battlefield? So we have, we have very good systems and very good methodology. Uh, where, where I would say NATO falls short is a lot of the doctrine is just too old. Mm -hmm. um, the last time we outdated, dealt, outdated, yeah, outdated, yeah. yeah. You know, the last time we dealt with serious trench warfare, mm -hmm. Western militaries, I mean, mm -hmm. um, we're going, we're going back about a century. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That's where the Ukrainian experience comes in, and and so. Yes, there are, unfortunately, there's a lot of the sort of, what I say, I call it legacy Soviet uh, methodologies mm -hmm, that are mm -hmm. still left in Ukraine. Where, where we're aiming to go is we're, we want to take basically this uh, Western methodology as mm -hmm. a framework. And on the framework, we want to put uh, the, the practical experience that Ukrainian forces have. So we're, yes, yeah, so as, like, like you said, we are marrying... Western methodologies or NATO methodologies, whatever you want to call them, and Ukrainian experience. And, and I believe that by basically loading the, the software that is Ukrainian experience into the hardware that is, that is the systematic approach to training we have mm -hmm. in, in NATO, I think that we can come out with a kind of a new Ukrainian standard mm -hmm. and one that, one that is more than the sum of its parts. Uh, and so that's the that's the goal of our organization. That's why that's why we are a, we are training saber training advisory group. Training advisory is very important there. Yes, we can deliver direct training. Mm -hmm. um, our organization has trained just over three thousand six hundred Ukrainian troops. Mm -hmm. Not all at the same level. It depends how much time we have with them. But that direct training is going to really it's going to be a fraction of what we do because where we're aiming to transition, we'll talk about, talk about this in greater detail later, I think, but where we're aiming to transition is to uh, do train the trainer and to help establish a, the, the, these Western training methodologies, but here in Ukraine, run by Ukrainians who have that Ukrainian experience. And once we have that, uh, you know, okay, maybe I can train 100, uh, 100 soldiers in a year, individually, I mean. If I train a hundred instructors in a year, mm -hmm. then Could they're they're you know they're going to go out. Each of them is going to train ten success. soldiers, and success. yeah, it, it becomes uh, it becomes exponential very quickly. And again, and and, it, and it's that we're building uh, self reliance. So we're not we're not just continuing continually giving Ukraine a fish. We're teaching Ukraine to fish. Well, in this all, case. all you. I mean, I I, re I really like your ideas, mm -hmm. your historical comparison, your experience. I will ask you one question, which I did not want to ask you, I, but I will ask you. And last question will be concerning the transition in the future. Before last question, I want to ask the following question. Before our interview, you told me about the information war. Yeah. Yeah. I, I understand that it's not maybe your and my professional uh, field, but going to media, speaking with media, with public figures, with broadcasters, we are in information. Yes. And we accept the information and we give and we are giving information. How do you see the problems in this field? Because it's very crucial. It is, it is. <laughs> uh, that's it, so... If you speak about English-speaking audience. Yes, the English-speaking world is in a, in a... There's a lot of transition, there's a lot of flux in the information sphere because there, there are certain things where people have been uh, have been lied to, mm -hmm. and uh, everyone's unfortunately it's very it's also very um, volatile emotionally because yeah. there are people who who have chosen 
uh, they've kind of tied themselves to certain information sources and they've said, I'm going to trust this information source no matter what they tell me. Yeah, it's like stock exchange. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah like exactly, that, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Like I, I'm going long on, on, on CNN or I'm yeah. going, you know, I'm going long on, yeah. on YouTube. Um, but the, the issue is that in that information sphere, people have gotten so emotional about it and so partisan that they, they don't look at anything else. And the, the problem is, is like basically your, your worldview uh, often in the West is going to be entirely shaped by your sources of information. And the Russians are, the Russians are, uh, have always been very good at informational warfare. Pro propaganda. Uh, yeah, propaganda. Yeah. It, that, that's, you know, it was, it was a tool of the, uh, Soviet of the Russian Roman Empire. Yeah. The, the Soviets, I believe, perfected it. Yeah, and then uh, modernized by... More or less, although they're still running the same playbook. Okay. Um, they they lie the same way um, because I don't I don't think I think after the breakup of the Soviet Union, really the the best parts of the Russian Empire all left the parts that had the, the real brain trust, we'll say, and so Russia Russia could kind of continue reading from that old playbook, but I don't think that they can add very much to it, with exceptions. Obviously, there are always exceptions. Mm -hmm. um, however. They are now, we had some early gains in the information sphere in the beginning because everyone was paying attention to Ukraine and they were willing to listen to Ukrainians because it was Ukraine being invaded. As things settled in, basically as soon as um, uh, was Will Smith slapped Chris Rock. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> My knowledge of celebrities is terrible. <laughs> but it was at that award show and that made big news and that, was, that just turned the page on the news and since then we've been on a gradual every once in a while there's a little bump up but gradual decline in in media attention in ukraine and that has been a disadvantage for us because then people start defaulting back to the old mm -hmm. narratives and the old mm -hmm. narratives were installed very early by the mm -hmm. soviet union uh, uh, uh for example the way that they hit the way that they lie about ukrainian uh, uh patriots the way that they uh, lie about the the about Ukrainian nationhood, because you'll hear a lot Ukrainian nationhood. Oh, Ukraine as a nation only existed since 1917, and mm -hmm. then it's like, well, hang on. There's treaties from the 16th century that were signed by Bohdan Khmelnytsky. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, the whole toxic relationship between Muscovy and Ukraine started that long ago. Um, you, you know, a polity of people and a nation of people has existed here for 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. It's not since 1917, but the Soviet narrative is, is the one that's installed because it's, uh, it's simpler and, it is they, and, and just by repetition. And so the problem, the problem that's facing us now is kind of uh, disrupting that, breaking back into that information cycle. Um, what, we, what we spoke about specifically was there was um, a, a media company in America called Tenant Media. Yeah, it's famous. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they're, 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 some, they're relatively on you. They do a lot of YouTube. That's their big thing. But the, someone who doesn't spend a lot of time on YouTube, maybe from older generations, will not have heard of them. Um, but it, it was proven uh, they received $10 million in, in financing from uh, RT, mm -hmm. Russia Today. Mm -hmm. And it was a big, uh, uh, um, I, I'm going to say it, it was a big failure on our side that when, when that was exposed, our uh, influencers, our uh, say, public figures, public yeah. figures didn't mm -hmm. immediately jump to, to go to start going Correct. on. To, yeah, yeah. Correct, yeah. Well, what you know, it's easy, of course, to be a, a, a armchair quarterback, yeah, 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 yeah critic. Yeah. But I was writing to the people that I knew. I don't, I don't know many in Ukrainian media, and saying, "Hey, are you guys going to try talking to these uh, these YouTube influencer influencers?" who were working for that, that company. Because the story is, the story they're saying is that they didn't know the source of the money. Well, this is an opportunity to say, hey, you were lied to as well. Mm -hmm. We've been lied about, you were lied to. Wouldn't you like to know the truth? And that's, that's, there was an opportunity to inject our message there. And I believe the opportunity still exists. But we, we, we have to do something because the endless repetition, we're like, uh, Russia, like it or not, has a louder voice because more people in the world have heard of Russia because Russia is seen as this great country, this amazing great mm -hmm. empire. Uh, it's why we even discuss the sphere of influence because they are, they are one of these imperial mm -hmm. uh, dynasties. They, they have more, say, more market share, more attention share. And so by us just kind of repeating the same things, 
we're, we're not going to break in. We have to, we have to find the nodes that they're using to spread their message. So like this, say, alternative media on YouTube, mm -hmm. break in and disrupt it. Find, find the people that are, that are saying this pro-Russian stuff, um, but who are persuadable, not the ones that are taking the money. The ones that are taking yeah, the money, they're, they're going to keep... Yeah, 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 we're not... You we should not, find the audience. Yeah. Get to the audience. Get to the ones that were lied to and say, you've been lied to and we will tell you the truth. And, and it's as easy as, I mean, I think it's quite simple. Invite these people out here and say, we'll show you. It's separate. Of course. Yeah, yeah. That's separate its own topic, conversation. Separate strategy, I would say. But yes. backing to our main topic, actually, this is also part of our topic, mm -hmm. including the information war, the battlefield or conventional war, mm -hmm. regarding what you said, in, uh, with about the uh, Western method, method, methodology and uh, the Ukraine experience. What, what the future, what the key to success? Understanding that mm -hmm. the, this war presumably, probably will continue the next years and the geopolitical situation is not good. So what, how we can uh, systemize, 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 systemize all these factors to get the victory and to get to save the country, actually. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And, and hopefully, hopefully prevent another world war. Um, the, so it's very similar to Trump's uh, decree. <laughs> no, 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 we keep Yeah, it. yeah, no, no. Well, but, there, but there's, yeah. there's, there's, there's... But prevent, preemptive, I would say preemptive. Pre yeah. Yes, preempt, yeah, because, yeah. because, yeah, people say prevent, but you don't... We learned in the Second World War that, that capitulation does not prevent Aggression. Like about the Munich, Munich, Munich. Exactly, the, the exactly. Rain, so if yeah. if there had been if there had been a forceful counter to like things like the annexation of Czechoslovakia, Hitler would not use it. Yeah, exactly. He would have known. He would have found his line and said, "Okay, they're not going to tolerate that." Agreed. Um, but that and that's why here our answer is is we need to achieve victory and mm -hmm. and it needs to be done through strength. We need to limit Russia with our strength. Yes. And how we're going to do that? So. You know, I speak to a lot of people. I was in uh, uh, Washington, D.C. back in July. Uh, one of our former instructors is uh, involved in politics. I won't say how, um, but he hosted me out there and he, he connected me to, to some people, actually, uh, in this case, from the Republican Party. Uh, they were very receptive. And you give just an example, the, which reflects the, the, the situation. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah continue. Yeah. So, uh, but what what they were looking at and what he was really hitting me with is that it's very likely that support we'll say we'll say the absolute dollar value of support is going to drop um i think just as a, as a function of of loss of attention uh austerity measures in governments because we're coming into a very rough economic time in the in the west well everywhere uh but uh we need to find efficiencies and one of the most efficient ways that you can spend money Mm -hmm. is on training. Um, when you teach a soldier, uh, especially a leader, mm -hmm. you teach them how to instruct, you give them the tools to instruct, and you, and you help them to build training programs that they can carry out on their own. It has, it has a, it has a one-time cost that's very low, but it pays dividends in the long term because, because the longer that instructor serves, the more experience they pick up, the more mm -hmm. training they do, the better an instructor they become. And they they also start creating that that junior leader becomes a senior leader and that entire time he's been mentoring soldiers who become junior leaders that become senior leaders and and so the way forward is unquestionably to we we have to do more with less we're never going to win an attritional war uh, large soviet armies defeat small soviet armies yes. so so ukraine must never again be a soviet military and we do that by increasing individual training, uh, investing in the low-level leadership. Mm -hmm. So there's one of the concepts that we push very heavily. It's very it's central to the I would say the NATO way of war, is something called mission command, mm -hmm. and that's where you allow flexibility in planning, and you allow every leader. I'm saying from the squad leader up, every leader has flexibility within their mission. To, to they have an end goal, and they have a general idea of how to do it but they have huge flexibility so that they can react to the reality that they run into while they're carrying out their mission. And, and that way they don't need to call for permission to ask, the, the sergeant doesn't need to call up this chain of people to ask the general if he can go left instead of right. 
um, because it shouldn't be that that needs to be the sergeant's call uh -huh. by by bringing this in and and uh, as as I said earlier taking the NATO methodologies and the Ukrainian experience marrying those together and building a a, a systematic uh, modernized Ukrainianized training program that's how we that's that's the way forward. We see that the benefits of things like that in uh, operations. The the uh, first uh, Kharkiv offensive mm -hmm. showed that. The offensive into Kursk showed that because in both of those cases you had you had uh, mass. You had enough forces in the in the uh, in place um, at the right time. You had coordination and planning, and you had uh, communication between be like between the different elements of the force that were moving in these areas. And in those cases, when we have mass and we have coordination, Ukrainian forces are able to overmatch larger Russian forces because the Russians do not invest in the individual. And they, they by which I mean they don't really train their troops. Some of them they do, but the ma vast majority they treat like meat conscripts. And when you have a force that is capable of maneuvering and coordinating and planning, it's, it's kind of like, uh, I, I make the comparison between a boxer and uh, kind of like a jujitsu master. Mm -hmm. and, and you can have a big, strong boxer, right? But if he's, if he's slow and if he, just, if he can never hit that jujitsu guy and that jujitsu guy gets around him and starts to choke out that boxer, it's game over. Yeah. And, and so we need to be, we need to be fighting jujitsu, not boxing. Mm -hmm. And it's it's already happening. We're seeing that with the with the uh, improvements to training, the lengthening of basic training. Uh, I happen to know on the inside that there are people in the military infrastructure, on the high levels as well. They are looking to new, we'll say, new solution providers. They're looking to new partners to work with to help improve training, uh, including um, uh, non-government partners, so nonprofits. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's something that we are seeking uh, as well. And we've had, we've had terrific success in that direction. We just have to kind of build the, build the momentum. Um, but this is, that's the way forward, is by creating a, a very modern, flexible maneuver force here in Ukraine that's able to fight that jujitsu mm -hmm. and get around the Russian boxer and, and choke it out. I like your figurative <laughs> meaning. And, uh, um, to be serious, I think that your idea is to create a uh, self-sufficient uh, military uh, complex in Ukraine, which will be the guarantee of the economical prosperity of Ukraine. Absolutely. You, will not, you, will, you cannot bring the money in Ukraine no. without creating a shield against Russia from Europe and uh, actually the Western world. Actually. Oh, for sure. This is the... like. Briefly coming back on the geopolitical thing, we're seeing a clash of, of worldviews here. There is an axis forming against the, the we call it the countries of the, of the West. I don't like to use the Western terminology mm -hmm. because I, I think that there is a, it's not perfect, but we'll say, we'll say kind of like the uh, North Atlantic, uh, the North Atlantic perspective. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the North Atlantic perspective, you know, people will, people will, uh, complain about the United States being overbearing, for example. But when the United States is being overbearing in a country, it's like, oh, talking about tax policy and, uh, and you know, sending some NGOs with some different yeah. cultural ideas, okay? When China or Russia or Iran is being overbearing in a country, then mm -hmm. you see genocide, you see uh, mass enslavement of populations. Um, and so the, the, the North Atlantic worldview well, it certainly could be overbearing, is overbearing in a much, much less harmful way than is the, the, the hegemony of this, of this rough axis that's forming against us. And it's not as if they're very tight, because Iran have their own interests that run mm -hmm. counter to Russia, as do China. But, but they, they have permanent interests which run counter to, uh, uh, to, to ours, those of us that are in, the, say, the, the North Atlantic bubble, which is also loosely affiliated, but still yeah. it, it serves. Still serves yeah. um, and, and so we need, to be a, we need to pay attention to this axis mm -hmm. and we need to pay attention to who our players are in the North Atlantic grouping. And, and Ukraine is the borderland. Ukraine is right here. We're on the edge 
where where the the say maybe the North Atlantic consensus and the the uh, southeastern hegemonies that we are where they meet. We are the shield of Europe, and we are the shield of the North Atlantic, um, because they if they anything they want to do, they do have to do by land, and they have to cross us, or they have to cross the Black Sea, or they have to break into uh, like the Baltic Sea, and the Baltic Sea is very well defended. Uh, but the Black Sea, you know, through the Bosphorus, that's yeah. the, that's our, this is our backyard. And we're doing, it's something that, so this comes into the, um, you know, Samostini, the self-supporting part where Ukraine is, is really shining. We have taken control, for the most part, of the Black Sea. The, the Russians, they had to move their, yeah. their fleet out of Sevastopol to Novorossiysk, Novorossiysk. and they've had to move it even yeah. further now. And, and so we're, we're dominating that space. And we, we are, we, the, the shield has closed there for the most part. We, of course, they still transit through yeah, the Bosphorus, yeah. but yeah. they have to do it in a very sneaky way now. Um, what, but to, to come back to the, the self-supporting thing, Ukraine has incredible intellectual talent, uh, incredible mineral resources, uh, the, 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 well, Incredible industrial resources and the potential for much, much yeah. more. Uh, and I and the reason the reason that I brought up the, the do, our, our dominance uh, in the Black Sea is uh, the sort of primary sign of that dominance is the uh, Neptune missile. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's an anti-shipping missile. Uh, it's a it is yeah. taken from an older uh, Soviet design, modernized but completely built. And designed here in uh, Ukraine. Ukraine experience and Western methodology. Ex well, exact, exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but there's, there's other, there's yeah. other great examples. The um, uh, BTR four Bucephalus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'll get, to, I'll get to. Draw, I know less about drones. Yeah, and, we'll speak another yeah, interview. Yeah. Right? Summarizing the the, the the main idea. Yeah. So you have you you get a lot of examples. Yes. And you think that we can do? You think that we can do? We can build up uh, self sufficient Ukraine. We now. can. I, I know we can because the the. Uh, for the English viewers, I'll apologize because I'm going to use some Ukrainian words. But we, we think about things like uh, mezalezhnist, hidnist, samostinist. Yeah. These independence, dignity, and self self sufficiency. Self sufficiency. Yeah. But it, what's what's interesting is that the two those kind of are three legs of a of a tripod. Um, at least the way that I have understood things over the past six years is that you can't have any of those 100% without having the others in place. You cannot be truly independent without having dignity and self-sufficiency. Mm -hmm. And you can't be self-sufficient without having independence to make your own decisions and having, and having dignity to, to take those decisions. Um, and of course, you can't be very dignified when you're not independent and not self-supporting. Self um, and so the way that we tie this together is that we, start, we just start building the capability and building the capacity here in Ukraine for defense manufacturing, for military training, and for uh, for, for innovation. Uh, there are it's, it's a kind of a Ukraine is a sleeper power in the world of tech. Not many people understand how many, for example, web hosting services are out here, massive massive uh, uh, data uh, centers that are designed and administered by Ukrainians, and it, and it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so thank I'll you keep for, going forever. For, thank you for very much. I will not cut uh, anything from your interview because it will be published full of. I think we can record another interview in the future, and uh, I think you are the voice of new cooperation between Ukraine and the West. Thank, thank you. you. Very much. I'd love to be. <laughs> thank you. Oh.